Welcome to Leadership in Hawaii on ThinkTech. I'm your host, Carol Mon Lee. On our show today, we're going to talk about how CBRE grew to become the largest commercial real estate company in Hawaii and one person's unique leadership style. If you want to ask a question or participate in the discussion, you can tweet us at ThinkTechHI or call us at 415-871-2474. Our guest for today's show is Joe Haas of Cheney Brooks, my old friend. Welcome to the show, Joe. Hi, Carol. Thanks for having me. <laughs> it's great to see you again. <laughs> We've known each other almost 40 years. Or I so. know. Yeah. I know. It's been, uh, it's been a long time. And then when I knew you, you were doing sales, right? Yes. I was a commercial real estate broker, um, and I worked for several companies when, when we were friends. Right. And then, so how did you become the president of CBRE? Uh, Which well, stands for Coldwell Banker. It, 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 now it's just an acronym. It doesn't have it actually words, but it's Coldwell Banker Richard Ellis, CB Richard Ellis. Mm -hmm. they, they called it for a while, and now it, it morphed into CBRE. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it's kind of an interesting story. I began. It began in uh, 2001. Uh, 2001 in business in Hawaii and around the world was a very bad year because of 9/11. And the dot com bubble burst on the on the stock market, so it was a very difficult year for business. So our company wasn't doing very well. Uh, we owned it at the time, me and ten or eleven partners, and uh, we we needed to make a change. So two of the partners started lobbying me that I should become the the, the managing director of the firm, and. Uh, had you had any interest at all in that side of the None whatsoever. The I had never managed before in any level, in any capacity, never. So I could you were barely manage to get to work. And brokerage. Yeah. I, no, I mean, yeah. Uh, one of the nice things about being a salesperson is you, you're kind of your own boss. But I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't managing people for sure, and nor had I ever. And you've never been trained in management skills? No. Oh, no. Academically or no. on the job? No, uh, no. <laughs> so I still know. Anyway, the uh, so they uh, so these two uh, two of my partners approached me and said, "Listen, we'd like you to replace the current uh, uh, they were co-managing directors running the firm, and they wanted me to replace them both." And I was I was reluctant to say the least. I was saying, "No, not me. I don't. I I didn't actually have that much admiration for managers in my career." So I didn't think I could make a manager, be a good manager. But at the end of the day, my, uh, uh, you know, when your partners are telling you that they need you to do this, it's difficult to say no. And I had a, I had a bit of an epiphany. I went to um, Thanksgiving dinner at one of the brokers' house, one of my partners' house, and we were, and I was sitting there, and the vote for whether who's going to be the next manager of the firm was going to happen the following Monday after Thanksgiving. And I finally allowed myself to think about what if I became the manager? What would be the first thing I do? And uh, if you don't want to be a manager, if you don't want to do a job, that's a bad thing to ask yourself because the idea popped in my head. We had a, we had a senior sales staff at CBRE and uh, we hadn't hired a, a new rookie salesman or an entry-level position in over five years. And so all these senior brokers didn't feel that, that it was worth their time to do small real estate transactions. So in a year when we're having difficulty uh, generating any revenue, we're turning away small business. To me, that seemed, that seemed like a, bit, a mistake and a bad idea. So I thought about it and I said, well, the first thing I would do is I would hire some entry-level people so that we can then do every, every deal. To cover an area that had been overlooked for years. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And, and uh, it, 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 it's a different kind of a thing. So, <laughs> excuse me, if, you, if we hired people, it was a whole, a whole train of thought led to my actually accepting the job. Uh, if, we, if we then hired new people, then we had to think about training those people. So who would do the training? I guess I could do the training, right? So, in fact, our, our motto, our, our number one motto for the, for the time I was manager at CBRE was make every deal. 
make a big deal. So as a philosophy, we, we wouldn't turn any, way, any business away anymore. Which was very different than the preceding. Yeah, we were concentrating on the larger deals because we're the lar we're a very large company. CBRE, if you don't know, is a publicly traded company. Uh, even though we were locally owned, we were part of this giant network. And so make every deal became our mantra. And so if we hired new people, then they had to be trained. And then who was going to train them? And then there was a whole lot of things that, you know, where they're going to sit, you know, and how are we going to take care of these people and how are we going to make them productive? And, and it all fell to, I was saying, I'm the only one that would really volunteer to do that, I thought. Uh, it was not be productive to take the other managers out of the, from away from being productive to do this. So I, uh, I thought about it and I said, well. Because you were moving out of sales now onto the management well, it, side. You were willing to The vote to was coming. That. And I w up until then, I had said no. And then I thought about it. And I said, well, if that's the right thing to do, to, to hire junior people and to make every deal, would that happen if I don't accept the job? And the answer I came up with is no. So then I had to do it. I had no choice. So on Monday, the following after Thanksgiving, the Monday after Thanksgiving, I told these two partners who were, who were lobbying me to take this job that I would indeed take it if I was elected by my partners. And I was. And you were. So from 2001 until uh, the time you left, which was last year, how, how big did the company grow? Well, under your leadership? Yeah, uh, it was, I, I took over the reins of the firm in 2002. And I was the leader until, until the end of 2011, 10 year period. Okay, and so in, in 2001, that very bad year, we had a difficult year. We, again, we owned the company, and at that level of production, the company would have to make changes. We'd have to lay off people. We'd have to downsize. We'd have to make sacrifices that we didn't want to make. And, uh, um, and, and if we continued to, to work at that level, we, we might well have gone out of business. So um, I went on my first month of the job, I had to put together a business plan. We needed to get a line of credit to operate. You know, so if, if There we, hadn't been one up to that point? Uh, there had been one that was with the parent company who sold the company to us. It, we had a line of credit with them for a period of time. Uh, but it would have expired and we needed a new one. And we were in a difficult situation as well. So it was more important than ever that we have it. So I put together a business plan. And so my first board meeting with our partners um, was, okay, in, in the first, I have a five-year goal. My five-year goal is to be earning, and I don't want to use specific numbers because it, you know, I don't work there anymore and it may embarrass the people that do. So I said it would be, we need to roughly in five years grow three and a half times bigger than we currently are in 2001. Uh, if, we, if we were successful, that would be more successful than any commercial real estate in Hawaii had ever been. My partners dissuaded me from that notion by arguing with me that, you know, if we go to a bank and we ask for a line of credit and we say we're going to do that level of performance when no one's ever done it before, they're going to think we're idiots. And they're going to think we're foolish and we'll never, get the, we'll never get that line of credit. So we negotiated. We were all, mostly, all the partners were brokers, mostly, and uh, we negotiated. So they wanted it to be far, uh, half that. <laughs> and and so we settled on, on, on three-fourths of that. And you made it. Well, yeah, we went and not only did we get the line of credit, it turns out in, in two years' time, we were three and a half times more successful than we were in 2001. And then in, in three years later, we doubled that. So we were, we were roughly, we ended up being like 700% more revenue than we generated. We just... We, we did, we, what we did was great. I mean, everything so happened. Years, was, was, hmm? you, you increased the revenue by 700%. Over 700. And how many employees did you grow by? Oh, we were, when we began the process, we had 40 employees. And we had a small management department, uh, relatively small. And uh, by, the, by the, the peak of our success, we were at 140 employees. And we were, um, well, our revenue is quite a bit more. It was, like I said, over 700%. So, so uh, let's, we, let's dig into how that happened. What are your, you, I mean, we, I know you as a warm, uh, <laughs> warm person. <laughs> yeah, I gave everybody hugs. That was my first thing. No, um, yeah, uh, well, the business plan was the first thing, right? Uh, Had you ever done one before? Uh, no. Okay. 
No, I just made that up. As, and sort of, it's sort of, you know, if I read a book about this, it'd be called Making It Up As You Go Along, I because see. I had no experience as a manager, as I said. Right. But, but, but unbeknownst to me, I apparently was paying attention to all the managers I had leading up to my taking this position. And unbeknownst to you, your managers were looking at you, seeing the potential. Yeah, I don't know about that. But okay. <laughs> They were desperate. Maybe, but I, they, were, they didn't share that with me if that's what they were doing. These were my partners you right. might be referring to, but right. my partners maybe. Okay. So, uh, so let's talk about some of the different uh, tools yeah, that so you used to. In my, apparently, in my work history, I was paying attention to all the managers I had. I had many managers. I used to work at Xerox, which was famous for, for good management. That's where we met. Yeah, I was still working at Xerox. Wow, that's for her, right. Uh, that was over. That was about forty years ago. So uh, I was working with Zerox, and I had lots of managers, uh, and I was paying attention. I didn't realize it, but I must have been paying attention to what things I liked that they did, and what things I didn't like that they did. What I thought was stupid, what I thought was smart. And what did you like? And it was subconscious because I wasn't focused on it. But when I took over at CBRE. I started to realize that, and I didn't do the things I didn't admire, so you and applied. I did do the things I did admire, and it worked. And tell and us right. some of the things that you <laughs> that you admired. Because oh we uh, well, this. It, it was it was sort of make well. I, it's hard to say uh, specifically. I don't. Well, I don't, some of these. Uh, well, we talked about some. Okay. Of them. Well, let me tell you some things we did. Okay, yes. and how that worked. All right. First thing we did was, uh, after the business plan, is we did what, the, what is known as a SWOT analysis. SWOT, S-W-O-T. Yeah, it stands for Strengths, Weaknesses, Opportunities, and Threats. And, and so we got all the partners in a room for a day. I forgot, I think we met off campus too, so we were in some hotel or something. And we talk about all the strengths of the company. What, what are we great at? What are, what are we good at? What can we do? Blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then what are our weaknesses? You know, what what uh, you know what things aren't we good at that we should be good at uh, what are our opportunities what what potential is out there and uh, you know how can we grow where can we where can we do well you know and then threats uh, who our competitors are what their strengths are and things the like the market that. might be doing it's a very very uh, important process to go through as a manager i highly recommend it uh, uh, I joined Cheney Brooks uh, earlier this year, and it was the first thing I, I had the senior management, and we did a SWOT analysis because they knew everything about the company, but I did not. But it brought me up to speed pretty quickly. And in the process of doing it, you get ideas. I mean, you, is it something that you do on a regular basis to review how things yes. might have changed? So every few years. Uh, well, I'd rather it depends. Uh, I mean, I have a new uh, organization now that I'm working with, and and. Uh, so I don't know if they tolerate me doing it every year, but if I could, I would. Okay? okay. I think okay, it's so that that's... helpful. Uh-huh. All right? Uh, also, it's important to set big goals. Okay? Uh, there was a book I read that, that just talked about uh, big, hairy, aggressive goals. <laughs> <laughs> the A. <laughs> she, Carol's laughing because I didn't write aggressive down on a <laughs> piece of paper I gave her. So big, ha big hairy, aggressive goals. And uh, you have to be able to dream a little bit, like that 10, um, I'm sorry, I'm trying not to speak specifically about numbers, about that three and a half times growth of revenue in five years that I described earlier. Uh, that was a big goal because nobody believed it was possible. Right. right. But because we set a big goal. So I do mean, you have everybody buy into that goal? Yeah. How do you do that? Well, it, it's a process. Uh, you, you know, I started out by saying it. And then, and then I said, okay, if that's our goal, how do we get to our goal? And then I, divide, and then I came up with, with strategies to achieve the goal. Let me give you an example. Our biggest competitor uh, at the time, and I think still, is Kyers. Is Kyers. Then, then it might have been Monroe, Kyers, Monroe and Freelander. Uh, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. Right? Kyers, Monroe, Freelander. They were our biggest competitor. They had... Years earlier, because uh, I, I know this because I used to work there, they had years earlier opened an office on Maui, uh, and uh, it had an interesting result from that. I'll explain in a minute. Okay, great. Well, on that note, we're going to come back and listen to the rest of the story. This is Carol Mon Lee uh, on Think Tech Hawaii with my guest, Joe Haas, and we'll be right back. Aloha. My name is Stephen Philip Katz. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, and I'm the host of 
Shrink Wrap Hawaii, where I talk to other shrinks. Did you ever want to get your head shrunk? Well, this is the best place to come to pick one. I've been doing this. We must have 60 shows with a whole bunch of shrinks that you can look at. I'm here on Tuesdays at 3 o'clock every other Tuesday. I hope you are too. Aloha. Aloha, my name is Raya Salter, and I'm the host of Power Up Hawaii, which you can see live at from 1 to 1.30 every Tuesday at thinktechhawaii.com and then later on YouTube. I am an energy attorney, clean energy advocate, and community outreach specialist. And on Power Up Hawaii, we come together to talk about how can Hawaii walk towards a clean, renewable, and just energy future. To do that, we talk to stakeholders all over the spectrum, from clean energy technology folks to community groups to to politicians, to regulators, to the utility. So please join us Tuesdays at 1 o'clock for Power Up Hawaii. Welcome back. This is Tara Man Lee with uh, my guest, Joe Haas, talking about leadership in Hawaii and his many years of heading CBRE, uh, making it the largest commercial real estate company in Hawaii. And we were just talking about a great story about you and Collier's Monroe Freeland. Yes. Uh, uh, so for, as an example, as a strategy, a growth strategy for the company, I knew that uh, having worked at Kyers earlier in my career, that they had decided, they initially opened an office on Maui. And uh, the, the man who was running that office on Maui left the firm and started his own company on Maui. And I remember Andy Freelander saying, hi Andy. I remember Andy Freelander saying that I will never open up an office on the neighbor islands again. So my strategy was, well, if our biggest competitor is not going to be in the neighbor islands, we're going to be there. Because we wanted to be a full-service company. We wanted, we wanted to give the opportunity of all our clients to do business on the neighbor islands uh, using us. So that was a typical strategy. Right. I so called that strategy. attention on some random remark. Yeah, yeah. So that's it, an opportunity. I call that strategy to hit them where they ain't strategy. <laughs> I did, really. I have an actual name for it. So you moved to the neighbor islands? You opened offices in the neighbor yeah, islands? Yeah, I didn't move anywhere. But oh. <laughs> we did open, we opened, we opened offices in Hilo, Kona, uh, Kahului, uh, Lahaina, and, and, and uh, Kapa'a on Kauai. Right. So, yeah, we were everywhere. Now, those offices, uh, they were not big players. They were marginal players, but they did afford us the, uh, the opportunity to offer services. Sure. For, we have clients, uh, for example, Alexander and Baldwin, who were mo on most of the neighbor islands, if not all, and we could service their needs everywhere. Okay. So it was a good strategy. Yeah, really. Uh, another thing uh, I, felt, I thought was very important was to question everything. Question everything. Yeah, and it worked great for me because although I was with the firm for a long time, I was only in the broker piece. Right? I wasn't in the management side or the administrative side. So uh, I was able to just question, why, why do you do that like that? You know, what is... So you were naturally interested, curious. Yeah, and... no, I, no, it's not that. It's like, I always think I know a better way to do it. I see. I look at it, I go, I think uh, that doesn't seem like a good way to do it. I had a, uh, by the way, I, in the service, I, I worked in the clerical side. I was a finance clerk. And before that, I did accounts receivable and... and uh, and payroll for, for a fairly mid, a mid-sized company. I was responsible for that. So I had some, I had a lot of administrative background, uh, plus the sales background. So uh, anyway, so I question everything. And, and, and when you do that, people will tell you why they do it that way. And, and if, if you have a better way to do it, sometimes it saves them time and, uh, and they appreciate it. But mostly they, they think you're annoying when you ask them that question. When you ask questions all the time, why, why do you do that? Why are you doing that? Well, that brings up a question of style. So what is your style? Do you like one-on-one? -on -one? Um, do you email? you phone call? No, I, are you a team I, player? Do you yeah, like if, it's, uh, if it's anyone in the office, uh, the people I now, I now work with, Cheney, as you know, and, and uh, I never send an email internally. I go see them. And unless they're not in the office, desk. I will walk to their desk and speak to them every single time. I think it's good manners. I do. And, and, you know, and they see you and you're there. You know, you're not some mystery person. We were never big enough, except the neighbor islands, obviously. But right. we would travel fairly often mm -hmm. to the neighbor islands. So I would, for example, so I, I think the personal touch is always better. How about technology, though, in general, as, as it has evolved since 2001? You know, cell phones. Oh, and yeah, it sure else. has. So how have you kept up with that? And... How has that helped CBRE? Well, it, it, CBRE being a big international firm, 
they were they were there with uh, um, the technology. You know, they pushed that technology to us, and and we had to fit into their little cookie cutter of how it's done. We had all very old versions of let's say Excel and 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 Windows, but they worked, and every and and it was and they were they were uniform throughout the platform, so they worked with each other very well. So that wasn't a problem, uh, but. Technology, I mean, you know, obviously cell phones make communications mm -hmm. better and with, and uh, email certainly, uh, the ability to communicate with clients was instantaneous and, and, and robust and it allowed us to have a paper trail for everything we did. So there's a lot less misunderstandings. It was very good in our, for our industry as a whole, not just CBRE specifically. Right, right. So has technology placed the need for more employees or? No. <laughs> no, I didn't know, I didn't, that didn't, we didn't have any of that. Our type of business seems a little resistant to that, I think. Um, I also think, uh, I also noticed that, I also tried to make very small changes in our operation. Uh, I mean. Like what kind? Well, that's a good question. I, I'm, I'm trying to think of a, of a particular change, but just let me talk about it philosophically a yes. little bit. So it, I like this analogy. If you're going, you know, when, back when they were having the moon landings, they, they talk to, yeah, I know, I'm a little off the subject, bear with me. And, and uh, you have a trajectory to the moon, and you had to hit it as exactly. If you were off by 1% on your trajectory going to the moon, when you left Earth, it wouldn't, be, would, wouldn't even be noticeable. But by the time you got to the moon, 186,000 miles away, I think that's the right number. <laughs> You would have missed yeah, the moon. Yeah, tweet us if it's not right. right. And uh, uh, if by the time you got to the moon, you'd be out by 10,000 miles. So a little change over time becomes a big change. And I, and I, and I believe that. And uh, so I would look everywhere I could to make little changes in how we do something. So I would get a CD and we played it for Muzak in the office. You know, or, or on because whole music. There was no music before. Yeah. We had speakers, but we had no music. I see. I don't know. Don't ask me why. <laughs> Uh, and uh, and things like that, just little changes I would make. I'd change the coffee book, the coffee table book, uh, and then I'd have a contest internally to say, uh, oh, there's been a change in the office. The first person who, who can tell me what that change is w uh, wins $25. And we'd have like, I get like 25 emails like that. Right. It was very interesting. Right. And so it sort of kept everybody loose and interested, and it sent the message that we were growing. And initially in our business, because when I first started as manager, my main job was standing by the mailbox and waiting for checks <laughs> to arrive. Uh, but once we got past that, it was like the people could see things were getting better. Oh, and another thing I did was uh, I'm an ex-Xerox uh, uh, salesman and tech rep too. Uh, so one of the very first things I did was I, I, uh, I changed out our copier. To Xerox. To, uh, I upgraded them. Uh -huh. I had the Xerox copy. We had Xerox copiers. We had two, one color, one black and white, and I upgraded them. I went and got better ones because I know, I know how Xerox works. If you get a bigger, more capable copier and you're releasing it, it's roughly the same price. But you use it more, so you use more supplies, and they make more money, and you get a better product. And, of course, you're very paper-driven. <laughs> yes, time. we are. Yeah, yeah. There we were. Mm -hmm. And so that, uh, there, was, there was something that the, all the employees could see an improvement in everything they did. So it was really good. So, and let's see, let's talk about how your uh, former managers and how, how did that work out in terms of keeping um, your, your senior managers who were now reporting to you. Yeah, that was, that that was kind of interesting. You know, it, it, uh, there, were, there were some of them who immediately were okay with that and some were not. And, and it wasn't, it wasn't uh, necessary, it wasn't, you know, any rebellion or anything like that. It just was they were like, yeah, yeah, I, uh, I'm okay with this, you know. Like, leave me alone, mostly that. And, and I'm questioning everything, right? So we had, we had a meeting of the minds there. Uh, one of the things I think it's important to be is if you're going to be a manager uh, with no training in particular is to be yourself. Uh, I, uh, I, I participated when I was at CBRE uh, on a, what they called a management 360. It was like a, sort of a psychological evaluation as to what, is, what goes into being a good manager. And to do that, they have to have a baseline of where you are. And so I, was, I belonged to the executive committee in the Western United States for CBRE. And 
we, everybody who was on the executive committee participated in this. And then they plotted it on a chart, and it was sort of like an octagon or a hexagon, I forget. And on one side is like a very strict manager, and the other side was like a cupcake person, right? And so, and then they, and then they give you a battery of tests to determine where you, where you fall in this in two areas. One was in your management style or, or at work and your, and your personal style at home. And so when we got the results, we all shared, everybody could see where everybody else was. On mine, and this is something I'm very proud of, I, I can't tell you how proud I am of this, it's, it's on my chart, it had my, the Joe at work and the Joe at home were right next to each other. Oh. Everybody else in the, in the, we're two different in the group, they were on one side or the other, and they were several inches apart on the plot. So in other words, at home, there are different people at work. Um, but I'm not. I am the same person, like we're sitting here, or I'm sitting at home, or we're, we're out having uh, cocktails, or, or uh, whatever. I'm always the same. Uh, this and so is, you think so that's a really uh, important factor? I do, to how because you people, carry on as a people, people sense if you're insincere. If this isn't really you, they can, they can smell that. <laughs> you know? It's so just this thought of mine. Because, yeah. I mean, I've worked for people that weren't. Right. You know, and I and I saw it, and I don't admire it. Now I didn't do anything differently. Apparently, this is this is who you just are. Just how I worked, how right. it worked. So, so how about coaching and mentoring and training people to take over? You know, you left. CBRE, yeah, so. it turns out I uh, I really enjoyed teaching, and uh, you're a former teacher, yeah. and uh, uh, I uh, I enjoyed I enjoyed the process of training. We had a lot of fun. It also allowed me as the manager to bond with the new people in, in uh, you know, uh, on a different level. You know, I mean, it, your, the relationship between a teacher and a student is different than a boss and, a, and, a, and a, an employee. Right. So it, it was a very good exercise, I thought. Right. Plus, I got to import, hopefully, the, uh, how to do the business with them. Well, you know, Joe, this time has gone by so fast, and we only have about 30 seconds left. So oh. I'm going to let you look at camera four and give us some closing remarks about leadership. Yeah, well, well, first of all, I'd like to thank my wife, Karen. Uh, I couldn't have done this without Karen. Hi, sweetie. And uh, uh, I, I'd like to leave you with this. I think, I believe that it's very important that you ask yourself good questions. And if you have problems, problems will pop up in work and in life, and it's a very important aspect of, of everything you do on how you handle and address those problems. And I believe that if you have a problem, if you ask yourself good questions about it, like how to solve the problem, if you ask yourself in the right way, your mind will come up with an answer. That's why people say, let me sleep on that, because they, they think about a problem, and then they sleep on it, and hopefully they get an answer. So uh, don't ask yourself stupid questions. Don't say, why am I so stupid? Because your brain will answer that for you, too. Ask yourself, like, uh, well, gee, I got this problem with, the, with this client, and uh, I'm not sure what to do, and, and how do I make this okay with the client and still keep their business? That type of a question, your mind will answer it, and you, and you will solve some of the most difficult problems you'll face. So with that, thank you for having me, Carol. Well, thank you, Joe. And I'm going to say one last thing that you and I talked about is that Street smarts. Oh, yes. I thought we ran out of time. Okay. Street, yeah, I got a PhD in street smarts. I'm a New York City kid. I grew up in the main streets, and uh, that has always served me well, too, because uh, you got to be real. Real. <laughs> and on that note, we're going to thank Joe so much for this fun. Oh, it was interview. a pleasure. Let's do it again. Yeah. Thanks, Carol. Okay. Bye-bye. Well, aloha from uh, Think Tech Hawaii. We'll see you next time. This is Carol Mon Lee, and thanks to our floor manager, Ray Sangalang and our control room engineer, production engineer, Rob McLean. Aloha.